Proper mineral and vitamin nutrition contributes to strong immune systems, reproductive performance, and calf weight gain. However, when it comes to selecting mineral supplementation to use for your beef herd, it can often be a confusing decision as not all mineral mixtures are the same. To help cattlemen better understand what minerals are needed for beef cattle, OSU Extension in Coshocton County offered a webinar titled Minerals for Beef Cattle on Tuesday, March 16, 2021. During the session, participants learned the ballpark levels for mineral supplements for beef cows on forage-based diets and discussed macro minerals, trace minerals, and best practices for mineral supplementation. Sample mineral tags were reviewed and participants learned what to look for and how to fine-tune mineral supplementation based on their hay sample analysis. The program featured Dr. Steve Boyles, OSU Extension Beef Specialist, and Garth Ruff, OSU Extension Field Specialist for Beef Cattle. We join the program now as David Marison, OSU Extension Educator in Coshocton County, introduces the program and the speakers. All right, we'd like to welcome everybody here to tonight's program, Minerals for Beef Cattle. Um, this was an outgrowth of a producer asking about minerals, um, actually three or four producers, about a month ago asking some questions on minerals, and that we got some answers from that. And from there, we said, well, why not put on a program? So I'm really pleased tonight that joining us is Garth Ruff and Steve Boyles, both from the Ohio State University, who are going to talk about minerals, feeding minerals for beef cattle. Um, just a, a quick introduction on um, both of our presenters tonight. First, I'm gonna lead us off as Garth Ruff and Garth is our newly anointed field specialist for beef cattle. Um, has been in that position since I believe July, 2020. Um, so right, if that's right, Garth, about a, a, almost gonna be a half of a year here, but not a, not a stranger to OSU Extension because he was a county extension educator up in Henry County since 2017. And prior to that, got his BS and, BS and MS degrees in animal sciences um, from the Ohio State University. And Garth grew up, of course, down in Morgan County where he's relocated um, to take over as the beef field specialist for Ohio State. And then followed by Garth, we'll have Dr. Boyles. And Steve, I, I think you were one of my first people to come up when I started my career 25 um, years ago up in Ashtabula County drove all the way up on a snowy winter evening and um, for a crowd of beef producers. And you've been a great friend to Extension for the fact that you've done programs all across um, the state for us, but you grew up in, um, grew up on farms in West Virginia, Ohio. You have a great background BS degree from Virginia Tech in animal sciences and MS from of course, the Ohio State University in reproductive physiology and a PhD in nutrition um, from Kansas State. So Garth and Steve, we're so glad that you could join us here um, tonight with our beef producers here in Coshocton County. So with that, Garth, I'm Steve, welcome. Um, and thanks for doing this program for us. Well, Dave, thanks for the opportunity to uh, teach here this evening. Uh, you know, can't beat uh, some good Buckeye football tunes to, to get geared up here for, you know, what may not be the most exciting nutrition topic, I think, when we talk about beef cattle nutrition, but one that's certainly very important as we talk about minerals. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be on a program with Dr. Boyles. So let's go ahead and let's get started. You know, what, what are minerals? Well, it, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you to death like some of my chemistry professors did at Ohio State with this. Um, you know, when we think about elements, you know, there's a kind of four major elements uh, that, that make up a cell, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, uh, the four most abundant elements uh, in any uh, living being. And then we get into the kind of five through the rest of the list, or that's what kind of what we refer to as minerals, right? And, and it really starts with calcium and phosphorus being the next two. Uh, in terms of abundance and the importance uh, to the skeletal system that they play. And we're going to, I'm going to talk more on the macro mineral side. Uh, Steve's going to talk some more about micro miner minerals uh, and may maybe touch on some vitamins. And then we're going to finish up this presentation with, you know, some strategies to manage uh, your mineral system, uh, manage mineral intake, 
and really reap the benefits of a well-rounded mineral program. You know, it, I think as we look at that periodic table, uh, you know, we could spend a significant amount of time talking about how the different minerals and different elements are related uh, to one another. But as we go through this, keep in mind that there are several complex interactions uh, that happen within the cells, in, in this case of, of that beef cow, uh, with regards to nutrient requirements, uh, you know, maintaining metabolism, cofactors for enzymes. Uh, th this can be pretty complicated, uh, but hopefully by the time we're done here this evening, you won't be able to at least pick up a, a mineral feed tag, look at the ingredients, look at the analysis, uh, and be able to tell whether or not that, that that's a high quality, quality mineral uh, that's gonna meet the needs for your operation. So I really like this slide, and this is actually one from Francis Fluharty. You know, let, let's kind of get this out of the way. You know, this mindset that cattle don't need to be supplemented with mineral, uh, and that uh, folks like Dr. Boyles and myself and feed companies are just trying to sell product. Well, that might be the case if we lived in an area that didn't have mineral deficiencies, such as selenium or magnesium. We're gonna talk more about those two minerals specifically. And then if we didn't have things such as internal parasites reducing nutrient absorption, or in a case where we're feeding mostly alfalfa, corn, and soybean meal, uh, and then keep those animals on confinement, you know, that's, that's a whole different discussion. But in the case of the beef cow, if our cows are not breeding well and maintaining those pregnancies, or we have calves that are not gaining weight on pasture, uh, I'd encourage you to stick around for the duration of this talk and we'll learn how minerals play an important role uh, in pr the productivity of the beef herd. So I didn't have David necessarily put up polls. You don't have to raise your hands or anything, uh, but think about these questions to yourself. Have you ever cut your mineral mix with salt? You can see here in the bottom corner of this slide where uh, by salt alone actually reduces the percent digestibility for protein, fiber, and TDN as in terms of energy. And a complete mineral mix um, on the inverse improves that. Have you ever claimed deer don't need minerals? All right. Think about how, how, how a deer forages uh, and browse in the wild. But even then, we're not measuring reproductive efficiency. We're not measuring average daily gain uh, on, on those deer. Have you ever blamed a bull for not breeding your cows? I think this is a pretty common one. We get an open cow. Uh, come calving season. We don't know why she's open. Sometimes we blame the bull. Excuse me. Sometimes we decide to give that cow an another chance, but it could be just a, a simple thing in terms of, of a mineral deficiency one way or the other. We use salt blocks or white salt because they last longer, or we think that your cows are eating, consuming too much of a mineral. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up with that here in this particular talk this evening. So another myth is that we don't need to soil test for pH if you raise livestock. Uh, you know, I just spent a couple hours recording uh, an episode of our, our, our forage focus uh, extension program on this very topic. All right, we're in the spring of the year. You know, it's a great time to talk about the potential for increasing pasture and hay field fertility. You know, we're just kind of talking with David there. This is an area, if you're interested in doing some on-farm research and pasture fertility or fertility of hay fields, get a hold of David uh, and we can put a plan together. But soil fertility is key with regards to mineral availability. And it's just not the mineral availability to that particular plant, all right? If we can't get the minerals in the plant tissue, uh, we can't get them into the digestive system of our animals. And you can see there, in a lot of cases, once we get below a pH of six, uh, mineral availability 
certainly decreases uh, for things such as phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, magnesium, spend more time on magnesium. Yep, good reminder from David uh, regarding soil tests and they can certainly provide that there through the Coshocton County office. And then another myth is that our animals are nutritional, you know, and, and that they're gonna take care of themselves. And that might be true with things such as, you know, not eating toxic weeds, uh, if there's a better option. But a lot of times we need to provide a complete mineral program in order to maintain and maximize efficiency of the herd. So here's a study uh, from the U.S. National Animal Health System where they looked at 320 some operations across 18 states with over 354 samples. Uh, and really this represents a large portion of the beef cows in the United States as far as these forage samples. And what we can see here regarding the percentage of forage samples that met the mineral needs for these cattle, you know, in a lot of cases, we were either deficient or marginal uh, for that given mineral. You know, if we think back to that slide with mineral interactions, there were six different minerals that interacted with zinc. And in this case, only two and a half percent of those forage tests were adequate uh, in terms of zinc levels. Two thirds were almost deficient. You know, here in Ohio, we're going to talk about uh, magnesium. It's not on this particular slide, uh, but selenium, you know, can be a challenge as well. You know, when we think about things such as iron and manganese, some of those minerals that are needed in much lower levels, uh, you know, oftentimes they rate a little higher in terms of being adequate in our forage samples. So not only do we need to test our soil uh, and look at pH and mineral availability, taking a forage sample, not only of hay, hay lots, you know, a lot of times we talk about sampling forages and it's hay, uh, but we also need to sample our pasture to see what's available to our livestock in terms of minerals. Uh, so you can see here the mineral requirements for beef cattle. This is on a percentage basis. Uh, and I just put this up here to really show how little uh, some of these minerals are needed on a daily basis. You know, we talk about parts per million with our kind of micro or trace minerals. You know, we get to something like selenium at 0.2 parts per million. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot, but when that 0.2 parts per million is not in the system, we can certainly see um, it, its effects in terms of a deficiency, right? So the factors are, that are gonna affect mineral requirements of our grazing cattle is what are what is that animal's function? What are we asking that animal to do in terms of growth? Uh, if we have beef cows, we certainly hope that it, you know, once they have a calf, uh, we can maintain lactation, reach peak lactation. And what is their immune status or immune function? There are certainly differences within breeds, you know, the level of productivity, you know, think about a, a high lactating cow versus a more moderate uh, milk production type herd. Uh, the stage of production, you know, we talk often about the four cycles, the four stages of production within the given year, stress, and then when those interactions, and a big piece of this is that mineral availability. And as we scroll through the minerals on the slides, you're going to see up here in the top right hand corner, some different mineral compounds that we see on feed tags in the bioavailability of those particular mineral compounds. Um, you know, as we think about what a mineral program is not, it, it you know, is certainly as a standalone product, uh, these mineral blocks contain a lot of iron oxide or red iron oxide for color. All right, the technical name for iron oxide is rust. And in terms of bioavailability, it is unavailable to the animal. All right, so even though there is a requirement for iron, we need to consider uh, what form that it's in. Uh, and typically when we talk about using blocks as a solo uh, strategy to provide minerals, 
they might not be the best options uh, in terms of that bioavailability. Some functions in, of our minerals and vitamins, certainly metabolism, uh, immune response. We talked about those enzyme cofactors, especially things like zinc and cobalt. Uh, and it goes on and on. You know, we have iron and hemoglobin, we have antioxidants, functioning cell membranes, muscle contraction involves calcium uh, and, and several other minerals, uh, you know, hormone synthesis, bone formation in terms of calcium and phosphorus, and really any biological process we can think of uh, that happens in a beef cow it relies on proper mineral and vitamin nutrition. So we talk about macro versus trace or micro minerals. Uh, we can divide those into two categories. In general, when we talk about a macro mineral, they're gonna be required at that concentration of 100 parts per million or greater. And those are the minerals on a, on a mineral tag that are gonna be expressed as a percentage of the diet versus a trace mineral uh, that's often uh, showed in parts per million. You know, in the opening slide there, you know, we talked about cutting uh, mineral with salt. And salt's going to be one of our macro minerals. Certainly cattle need to consume it uh, somewhere around a one hundredth of, of a percent of body weight. Uh, so as, as we look at salt intake, if we have a mature cow weighing around 1,200 pounds, and how many of you have cows that average 1,200 pounds? Uh, but for the sake of math, we're going to keep it simple. You know, that 1,200 pound cow is going to consume, you know, somewhere between one to two ounces of salt a day. And in general, we, we actually do need some salt uh, to get animals to consume our free choice mineral. You know, whether that's loose mineral, mineral in a lick or a tub type thing. Uh, you know, the salt's really going to help with palatability of that mineral product. Uh, to reduce that metallic and astringent taste, some of our other minerals in that bag. When we think about calcium, and you can see up here the different supplements, calcium carbonate, chloride, dicalcium phosphate is pretty common, or even limestone and their relative bioavailability, uh, ranging anywhere from 125 to 90. And our major of course, major functions of calcium, I think we are all aware it's the major mineral for bone development and teeth. And what happens if we're deficient in calcium? All right, we may have symptoms that look like grass tetany. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, symptoms that look like grass tetany, you know, we think of things like milk fever, those uh, type of symptoms. You know, and as we look at forages, certainly for calcium level varies by species. Alfalfa is actually relatively high in calcium, uh, but it's relatively unavailable, all right? Up to a third of the calcium in alfalfa is not gonna be bioavailable uh, with, within the rumen system. So as we look at mineral tags, the ratio of calcium to phosphorus is really gonna depend on the diet. You know, and I know David sent us some mineral tags. You know, the one company, you know, had, had two to one, one to one, one and a half to one, two and a half to one based on uh, diet. So we really need to know what are feeding our animals in order to have an accurate calcium to phosphorus ratio. Phosphorus is going to be required for milk production and, and growth. When we think about grains in general. Uh, they tend to be relatively high in, in phosphorus and lower in calcium. Um, and the challenge with phosphorus, you know, Dave mentioned I was up in Henry County for a while, is that water quality concern. As we think about excess pee and being excreted into the system, um, certainly in, in, in fresh water, there are some water quality concerns. So if we can uh, utilize phosphorus efficient, efficiently, uh, you know, and in general, our feed tags are lower in phosphorus than they were even a decade ago uh, as the more emphasis on this water quality piece. You know, 
So those are kind of the two big microminerals with 99% total calcium and 80% of the phosphorus that's stored in our bones. We look at our supplement options there. Uh, two different forms of phosphate, relatively high bioavailability. Magnesium, this is one we spend a lot of time talking about here in Ohio. Um, as, a, as a mineral, it's required for basic metabolism. Uh, but our deficiency in magnesium is often a contributing factor to what we know as grass tetany. Uh, and it's not necessarily always we're, we're limited to magnesium, but it could be due to a high or excess rate of potassium fertilization uh, that limits magnesium uptake and absorption by forages. You know, once again, as we go back to the periodic table, magnesium and potassium are relatively close and thus uh, interact. As we look at a bioavailability and the different classes uh, of minerals or the different compounds of minerals, um, you know, the oxide form, when we talked about iron oxide being rust, uh, magnesium oxide uh, is one of the exceptions here in the oxide form that has high relative bioavailability. That's not always going to be the case as we look at different minerals. Potassium, the third most abundant mineral in the body. Uh, once again, kind of an antagonist to magnesium. When we talk about things such as grass tetany, is kind of the opposite of uh, phosphorus, where we're going to be higher in forages and lower in grains. Uh, the exception there might be stockpiled forage or hay, hay that's been rained on, uh, with potassium being more water soluble. Whoa. Uh, times where we see potassium deficiencies can be those receiving diets in the feedlot. Some symptoms are going to be, you know, reduced feed intake, rough hair coat. Those uh, animals look relatively weak. And it's not uncommon for a receiving diet to be relatively high in potassium. You know, think about Gatorade. We bring those cattle into the feedlot. They've certainly been stressed. They've been hauled over a period of time. We want them to rebound. Uh, you know, think about that hydration. Get, get back to drinking. Uh, provide some forage. And then get, get those cattle uh, switched over to that concentrate diet over a period of time. So this is a diet that uh, Dr. Boyles drew up here. You know, if we do find ourselves in kind of a magnesium uh, crisis, you know, where we can supplement that high magnesium mineral, some cracked corn, and of course a protein supplement, and hand feed that at a rate of about two pounds a day to assure that we have enough magnesium intake. Uh, if not a dire situation, you know, 15 to 20 percent um, magnesium oxide in a free choice mineral uh, with either six to 10 percent molasses or grain uh, is also an option here. You know, we're in that time of the year, the forages are greening up. We have that rapid forage growth. Um, you know, this is probably the time to get your high mag mineral ordered. Uh, and think about getting that in front of our cow herd as we turn out on the pasture this spring. Kind of like this slide, we, you know, it's relatively simple. Uh, I don't know that's necessarily voodoo, but when we think about that high rates of potassium and do a little algebra here, our concern is when um, kind of that coefficient of potassium relative to magnesium and calcium is greater than 2.2. Uh, with regards to magnesium absorption. So once again, that forage analysis, and it's my understanding that uh, David in Coshocton County has looked at some forage samples uh, here over the last year. So being able to know what your mineral content, at least your macro mineral content in those forages is key to making uh, a mineral decision here. And you can see in these some older samples from Eastern Ohio, where, where we have the percentage of K, the percentage of magnesium, percentage of calcium, and you know whether or not where we rate in terms of being 
greater or lower than 2.2. You know, here's a fescue orchard grass example where that kind of coefficient number is five, uh, 2.3 for fescue, fescue and red clover, a little high, 2.86. Uh, and then we bring alfalfa into the mix, fescue, red clover, and alfalfa. We actually get that number below two. Think about sulfur uh, as a macro mineral, certainly a part of our essential amino acids, methionine and cysteine, a major part of muscle development. Uh, but in most cases, we're likely to be in ex excess uh, than being sulfur deficient. And high sulfur levels can be a cause of uh, copper deficiency. Uh, one of my favorite TV shows is, uh, I believe on the History Channel, is Moonshiners, right? And the reason they use copper stills uh, to make moonshine is to bind the sulfur in that product. So there's certainly an interaction between those two minerals. Our total diet sulfur should not be greater than 0.4%. Uh, an instance where we might see a sulfur deficiency uh, would be in a feedlot diet for feeding high levels of non-protein nitrogen. Um, you know, if it's protein-based, you know, a lot of times we're getting that protein from those essential amino acids. To determine whether we have a sulfur issue, sometimes it's important to test our water. Also, from my experience in Northwest Ohio with Doug Wells, a lot of their water, surface water, does smell like rotten eggs, right? Um, and that's often the case here in southeastern Ohio too. Um, so if we have water at a 700 part per million sulfate sulfur, right there is our 0.4% dietary sulfur. So if you've ever smelled water uh, with that rotten egg smell, uh, you may have your sulfur in, in excess when we combine what's in the water uh, with what's in the diet. Will that always be the case? You know, from an agronomic standpoint, uh, there's certainly some interest in sulfur research uh, due to the Clean Air Act and, you know, the reduction of burning coal, uh, kind of here from Indiana up through Appalachia. You know, who knows, right? Uh, but I think as we look at plant intake of sulfur, that's where soil test uh, also becomes critical. The uh, challenge with sulfur is it's water soluble, similar to nitrogen in a soil test. Uh, so another opportunity to on-farm research to see if not only pasture crops, but corn or soybeans would have a uh, yield response or an intake response to applied sulfur. I'm going to stop here and Dr. Boyles is going to go through some trace minerals, micro minerals. Uh, and we'll finish up with some strategies to manage mineral intake. Well, you saw iodine, certainly be aware of that as a concern with possible goiter. Uh, that can happen. It's probably, and to say it doesn't happen in the United States doesn't mean it doesn't, but uh, if you ever work overseas the, where they don't have iodized salt, it's probably more of a concern. But be aware of that. It's easier to spot in young animals than old animals. But I'm going to uh, kind of focus on some trace minerals and uh, start off with selenium. And there you see all that dark area. Um, many of us have grown up in selenium deficient areas. Uh, we commonly would have uh, selenium in the uh, in the mineral mix and still recommend that, uh, but it's not uncommon to, uh, when calves are born, to give them a shot of selenium vitamin E as well to make sure you get over that hump. So if you're a cow-calf operation, you may not want to totally rely on your uh, mineral mix as a source of selenium, especially among those young animals. And those are the requirements, but one of the classics we think of when we think of selenium is white muscle disease. And there you see on the right uh, an example of that white muscle disease. And uh, the trace minerals, a lot of times, it's not so much average daily gain, but they may touch on infertility or reproductive problems. 
So if reproduction is not quite where you think it should be, there's a whole host of things to look at. But one of the things to check on are uh, your mineral supplementation. And here's an example of selenium, a deficiency. Uh, if you're running into white muscle disease or just retain placentas and then corresponding infertility, uh, let's focus in on that selenium. The unique thing about selenium is it's federally regulated. Now we can go crazy on whatever we want to do on a lot of minerals. Now, nutritionally, you'll pay for some of that. There are toxicity issues, but the federal government has involved with selenium and it has to do with uh, selenium toxicity, say in other parts of the world. You saw we're in a selenium deficient area, but there's other part of the United States, they may have some toxicity. So they say uh, the regulation is three milligrams per day uh, as part of the total diet. Now, giving that calf injection, selenium, vitamin E, that's, that doesn't count. So we're okay, we're not breaking the law. But be aware of this, and certainly the feed companies are, and, and just their, their mixes for uh, trying to accommodate uh, FDA regulations. There's a lot of words here on copper. Folks, I'm gonna make this slide simple. According to Steve Boyles, you should not buy a mineral unless it has a minimum of a thousand parts per million copper for beef cows. If you're going out there, look at that feed tag. You've got cows out in pasture. Look for a feed tag that has at least a minimum of a thousand parts per million on that tag. You can look at all these antagonisms there and that's fine. Uh, some of that standing forage Garth referred to, uh, there was like eight, parts per million copper, but the potassium or everything was so high that it interfered with its absorption. And some of the copper levels weren't even that high. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to find Ohio standing forages with two parts per million copper, four parts per million. The minimum, the minimum requirement for a beef cow is 10 parts per million. And that's like average milking. So what if your cows produce more milk than that? Well, you're already over that. And it's not uncommon to find a feed tag that's got, you know, double just what I said. And that's fine too, but I, my, my suggestion is a minimum there. Uh, I do have a comment, you know, small thing, copper oxide. If you look up in the upper right hand corner, that's not something that I would necessarily use in a uh, free choice mineral mix, but uh, there are some things you can do if you're worried about copper. And this perhaps applies more out West, they'll put use copper boluses. So they'll have these copper oxide needles in a bolus, uh, put that down their throat, and, uh, and then they work, seem to work pretty well because it's slow release. But that's an exception to the rule. Uh, copper sulfate uh, can be a pretty good source for us in copper. And as Garth mentioned, there's some uh, breed differences, and there are with this copper. Uh, absorption apparently is greater in Angus cattle than Simmental Charlet. Therefore, we may have to think about a different way, different supplement uh, for these different breeds. Uh, this is a work out of North Carolina. And here's day zero, the copper levels, the blue being the Angus cattle, and then the Simmental being that uh, kind of tan color. And so there you see the Angus animal is capable of maintaining higher copper levels in the liver. What they did next for 140 days, they fed a little bit, a little bit of copper, but then a thousand parts per million of iron, which interferes with copper absorption. Over time, both groups were in deficiency situations. So we have to keep that in mind about these interactions, but there can be, once again, these breed differences. Uh, so one mineral doesn't fit all breeds perhaps. Well, there's no such thing as a multi-species mineral kind of leading up to that. And here's probably a classic is that uh, it used to be my dad liked to run sheep and cattle together. Uh, you know, try to keep the dogs away from the sheep, that sort of thing. But anymore, I, I like sheep, but if I got sheep, I'm gonna put them in the pasture ahead of the cows because they need higher nutrition per unit of body weight. But the other things, frankly, what I just recommended, the minimum thousand parts per million, I'm gonna kill my sheep. 
So uh, you have to think about that difference there. Uh, goats, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert on goats. Like goats, I think they, they taste wonderful. Um, they're more tolerant of high copper levels. Maybe that thousand parts per million might work, but I just mentioned there are some companies that have some minerals out there that are 2,000, you know, approaching 3,000 parts per million. Uh, I don't know if a goat could handle that. So be cognizant of having different species together and things kind of have changed with how we minim uh, we've certainly increased production of cows and this is the reason uh, we've increased copper levels over time. A zinc defic deficiency. Uh, one of the things where I run into zinc deficiencies is I'll get a call from somebody that says they're having hoof problems. One of the first things I look at from a nutritional standpoint, what is the zinc level in the diet? Now, we also want to look at that, maybe the surface, what are they walking on? that sort of thing, uh, that it could be an environmental type of uh, trauma causing hoof problems, but it can be zinc. And I'll mention right now, I'm already gonna start talking about different uh, zinc sources. If I'm into hoof problems, I'm gonna probably be thinking about using a chelated mineral. That is zinc hooked to an amino acid or carbohydrate. And that product is absorbed either more rapidly or stays in the body longer and so that's one of the things. But overall, zinc, if you see uh, depression and growth, uh, you know, severe bone formation, that sort of thing, uh, we, we've got some problems going on there uh, with zinc. I'll be honest, uh, it's mentioned, you know, uh, iron deficiency, but uh, generally not a problem. However, if we're having some, uh, uh, you know, some problems with, parasites or something like that, we might look at it, but uh, it's not one of those things I have to concern myself with uh, all the time. But well, how to determine a mineral deficiency? There's clinical symptoms, forage analysis. I just mentioned copper. If you've got copper that's two to four parts per million in the forage, you're gonna have a deficiency. Another one, you can look at the animal. The animal here on the lower left, uh, kind of a tan color. If they've got white around their eyes, or maybe around their nostrils, or you've got black Angus cattle that kind of got red hair, that could be an indication of a copper deficiency. If you got Charlet cattle, what I just told you, it them out. But uh, those are maybe some signs you can look for. The cow on the right being terribly thin, yeah, that could be a mineral deficiency, but look around that animal as well. Uh, that could be empty belly disease. There's not a lot to eat out there, so it's not always a mineral deficiency. Well, so if you're in a real situation, this is working with your veterinarian probably, uh, you can look at plasma levels. You don't have to look at, you know, memorize this stuff. We have a uh, fact sheet at the OSU Beef Team website, minerals and their interactions that has all this discussion that Garth and I and I are doing. And it also talks about these different methods of more intensive evaluation of mineral status. So you can look at plasma, blood, you can pull it, but that's such a moment in time. Uh, you're gonna see the deficiency sooner uh, looking at, uh, at other organs. Well, here's low selenium, uh, mentioned that before, and high sulfur levels. And so these interactions can get complicated. Relative bioavailability, and Garth mentioned that, and this is kind of a rehash of that, but you've got the sulfate forms over here on the left that are, they're pretty good uh, at meeting our needs and they're not terribly expensive. Oxide form, uh, and Garth mentioned, yeah, you know, there, there can be some things we can do with mag ox. Uh, and then I just mentioned some organic forms, and I'm gonna talk about those a little bit, but when we talk about chelated minerals, that is once again a mineral that is hooked to probably an amino acid or a carbohydrate. And notice that they have higher bioavailability. And we can think about using those in more dire cases. So in general, 
uh, chelates are more available than the sulfates, more available than the oxides. Um, if you're feeding minerals at a low level, the body's going to come looking for them. So the more efficiently used, I'm not sure that that's a good strategy, uh, but nevertheless. Uh, and we've already talked about some of those interactions that happen. Uh, processing grain can change how the minerals are being used as well. And age can affect that. Not surprisingly uh, that, you know, young animals, their systems are more efficient, better than adults absorbing some of these products. Think about people of age, and we talk to them about, you know, calcium levels, keeping the bones strong, that sort of thing. So organic mineral sources, uh, where I really look hard at them uh, because they're, in general, they're more expensive. So is it something I'm gonna use all the time, 365 days? Maybe not. But if I've got a mineral deficiency that I need to fix, I might be looking at a chelated mineral. If a health problem, I might be looking at some of these problems. Or a reproductive problem, I need to fix and fix it quick. I might be looking at some of those, these chelated uh, problems. In, in general, some stress situations, I might be looking at these versus in just a general mineral mix. This is the new kid on the block. I think this one's kind of exciting, I'll be honest, is hydroxy minerals. And there you can see them up there. And they're kind of, they're kind of like a chelate. I'll put it that way. You can read that and it'll make, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but anyway, they are, have a, a loose bond and they in general are not quite as expensive as the chelated minerals. So once again, I think they're gonna, we're gonna see these more and more in some uh, mineral mixes uh, up there. So that uh, I think about 159 to 206 or, or that zinc hydroxide chloride, uh, quite competitive with a chelated product. So also from a, this may not be of interest to you, but feed companies, they tend to have more less dust and they don't take up as much room when you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, putting feeds together. And they don't appear, we're going to talk about vitamins here momentarily. They don't appear to be as hard on vitamin stability. So that can be a good thing too. So once again, I think we're going to see more and more of these what's called hydroxy minerals uh, being used. Well, cost versus availability. And I don't have to have the hydroxies in here because yeah, I, I don't want to say they're always cheaper than uh, chelated, but in general, organics are, are more available, as you see, going down to oxide, but in just cases, they can be more expensive. We're going to move into uh, direct fed microbials. I'm moving away from minerals at the moment and looking at uh, some other things that you might find in a mineral mix. To start it off, I'm going to give you an example. This was a graduate student of mine, and we did a stu stu study using Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and this was put in the free choice mineral mix. So you've looked at tags and you're gonna see something in there, some different things besides just minerals and vitamins uh, in some mineral mixes. And here's an example starting this off. How we, we looked at overall performance, but we also looked at how much milk were these cows giving, whether they were on this mineral mix with yeast or not. Well, what we did, well, cows were separated from the cows for eight hours. Now, after eight hours, they're hungry. So we weighed them before we let them, the cows come in. They would suckle for about 15 minutes, and then they'd kind of stop. So we would rush those calves as soon as they were done suckling. And if they were defecating, pooping while that, you know, we were taking out, we'd grab that poop and put it on their back, bring them over to the scales and weigh them. And that's how we measured how much milk we were getting. And we did this three times in 24 hours. <coughs> Excuse me, here's some of the results. This was a three year study. And I'll quickly orient you to this chart. We did it once again over three years and the controls were the blue bar and the yellow, this yeast product, a prebiotic, <coughs> excuse me, 
was in the mineral mix. There you see in general, the yeast product would increase milk production, but I need to hold off, that's numerically. One of the things you need to look at critically or ask is, is it significant, that difference? That's why over a three year time period, that big star over that last bar, that's a combination of those three years. 120 days away from calving, we had a significant improvement in milk production. So the yeast product, if you think about it, was having more impact <clears throat> during that latter part of the grazing period, say in that hot weather. So the, you, you know, the forage quality goes down then, then the yeast product was having more impact. Whereas 60 days out, that's still kind of springtime, pretty good grass. Yes, there was some positive there, but all those bars aren't statistically significant. So you have to think about that when you're evaluating some of these products. And the questions I have to ask when I look at scientific studies is, is are the statistics there that say, yeah, that is a real difference rather than just, you know, luck. Briefly mention fat soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamins are delicate compounds. They don't, they're not minerals. They're not minerals, they will break down. Uh, light may destroy them when they're stored out in the sun. And you think about, uh, well, Gart's gonna talk about mineral feeders and there's one of those things you have to think about. Uh, harvested forages such as silage and hay can have lower levels of vitamins uh, than you might think. Not surprisingly, especially let's say you've got hay that's two or three years old, probably the vitamin A is not there anymore, it's gone. Uh, so my, here's my rule of thumb on homemade mineral mixes. And you're, you know, maybe putting some vitamin pack in with the mineral. You need to do that about every two weeks, make up the mineral mix. Commercial mixes, I really think you should use them up within two months. You buy them. And the thing is, how long has that bag that you bought been on the pallet at the feed, you know, at the, at the feed store? Uh, that, you know, the degradation didn't start the day you bought it. So maybe you want to shorten that up a little bit. And actually this comes into uh, feed tags and Gar's going to go over this, is the viability of different yeast products and uh, enzyme products. The product I just talked about in the research study was a yeast product, but it's called a prebiotic. It's a yeast, but it's not really living. It provides nutrients to improve the uh, microbe population so it can chew on the forage. There are probiotics. These can be yeast or other organisms that are live. Well, they're kind of like vitamins. Um, they can degrade uh, over time and certainly minerals are hard on them. Uh, so that you can have a, a decrease in viability. So it's important to handle these in a proper way. Yes, they can work, but you have to treat them in a, in a proper manner. And enzyme products, kind of the same way, you know, with enzymes, you're gonna see some things and they're out of uh, yeast products. You'll they'll see some sort of uh, enzyme and then it'll be listed with a, uh, uh, like a, a yeast product where, where it's derived from. That with enzymes, we know more about swine and poultry and, and they work pretty well. In dairy cattle, we've seen some positive response. Sometimes we haven't. There's less information with them in beef cattle. And, and a lot of the research with enzymes, the stuff has been sprayed directly on the state of forage. The enzymes get on that forage and start chewing it up. Uh, and so I'm not saying it doesn't work in the mineral, but it's probably the least researched at this point. So they may put something in to help keep that viable, but those are the things to think about viability as well. That's beyond bioavailability, just viability. Uh, of the, some of these products that we have in, in mineral mixes. So with that, I am gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, we should be back on. We're gonna finish up here, you know, talk a little bit about managing mineral intake and managing the mineral feeder. Um, you know, I guess uh, first and foremost, you know, if mineral intake is too high and that's something to consider, 
you know, if we're feeding a high dollar chelated mineral, you know, wh why is it higher than it should be? In a lot of cases, that's because we're too close to a water source in a loafing area, you know, where it's convenient uh, for that animal uh, to, to lick or consume that mineral. You know, I got on the research farm manager today with some sheep. You know, you, you drive down the driveway and you see one go from the mineral feeder to the water and back to the mineral feeder. Uh, you know, at that point, maybe there's some luxury consumption happening. If mineral intake is too low, you know, then there's that opportunity to move that uh, mineral feeder closer to that water source. So we need to know what our actual, actual mineral intake is. And we can do that if we know the number of cows, counting the calves, uh, and look at those calves on a percentage of cow body weight and then multiply that by the expected intake. And any high quality mineral uh, should have that intake or intake range on that mineral tag. When we talk about salt, uh, there, are, you know, there are some minerals out there that are going to have on label to cut with salt. And I'm going to show you an example of that. The salt, the salt level in a given mineral mix, once again, is going to have that significant impact on intake. Um, and oftentimes, the level of salt is going to be manipulated to control intake. Because uh, that's the only animal that the animal is going to try to control intake of itself, right? However, we need to account for the additional salt when determining mineral intake. So if we cut our mineral because we think our cows are eating too much of it, um, and let's say we have a mineral that has a recommended feeding rate of four ounces per head per day, and that's probably on the high side, uh, and we cut that with a 50-50 ratio with plain white salt, then we've got to get that cow to consume eight ounces to maintain the same level of uh, mineral in intake uh, in terms of minerals that aren't salt. That's pretty high. You know, can, can we get a cow to consume eight ounces uh, of mineral in a 50-50 salt to mineral mix? You know, I put the example of French fries on here. I think maybe a better example is go to your local high school basketball game uh, you know, you, you want a thing of popcorn, but it's so salty you can't eat it, all right? And oftentimes there's not enough liquid or enough water uh, to promote intake of that product. So here's an example of what happens when we cut our mineral 50-50 with white salt. This is a sheep uh, feed tag. As you can see here in our guaranteed analysis, most of our um, levels are going to be just cut in half, whether that's protein, um, you know, whether that's some of our uh, micro or trace minerals, uh, potassium, you know, and in just a mineral mix, here's 2.2% versus a 50-50 mix of salt, 1.1. And really the only other change here, uh, salt becomes the main ingredient, right? So if we think about managing and uh, monitoring mineral consumption. Once again, it goes back to keeping a record of how many animals are going to be eating out of that feeder, how much intake should they have, and what is their actual intake. Um, buying a weatherized mineral uh, doesn't mean, you know, we necessarily don't need to check that regularly. You know, the, the worst case scenario, even with a weatherized mineral uh, in a variety of mineral feeders, is we, you know, forget checking intake, we forget to check it all together and it runs and we run out of mineral, right? Uh, so once we determine a cost effective, uh, high quality uh, mineral program, and, and we can alternate products throughout the year depending on forage levels uh, and cost, but certainly we, we want to maintain that animal's requirements throughout the calendar year. Uh, and calves eat too, right? A lot of times we think about intake from just the cow perspective. Uh, you know, and then we blame the cows for overconsumption. 
Well, keep in mind that the calves uh, could also be sticking their heads in that mineral feeder. And that's really what we want. You know, and, and Steve had a slide up there. You know, it, it may not be the only problem if we see re, reduced performance and reduced uh, reproduction. But the challenge with mineral is we don't have a good way to measure those negative implications. So again, some more absorption data uh, as we look at you know, the various feedstuff versus the various uh, mineral complexes, whether they're oxides, sulfates, or chlorides. You know, for, for my money, the, the magnesium oxide, the magox is, you know, probably the, the, the only mineral I'm going to feed in the oxide form. Um, now certainly there's cost associated with that. Uh, and there's a lot of high quality minerals out there available. And, and to an extent, you're going to get what you pay for. And I think Dr. Boyle's covered that with the relative bioavailability. Bio but it, uh, there's certainly a difference uh, in ingredients and in quality uh, as we compare a high quality mineral versus maybe uh, a poor or, or maybe one of those lowest cost minerals that are available. So how much mineral will a cow eat in a given year? Once again, let's use that four ounce daily example. Uh, over 365 days, she's going to consume just over 91 pounds of that supplement within a year's time. And you can see the math there. Um, you know, so we package mineral in 50 pound bags. So in this case, a cow mineral bag um, with four ounces a day intake, that's about 200 days worth of mineral for that cow. Then let's consider how many cows are going to be eating out of that mineral feeder or in that pasture. And then we can determine how long a bag of mineral should last. In this instance, let's say this bag of mineral is $35 a bag. That's only 17 and a half cents per day. All right. And I think as we look at some of our other management considerations, uh, 17 and a half cents per day is relatively cheap. Uh, if we look, especially at lost fertility, you know, what's, what's a calf worth today and what does it cost you to keep a cow? Uh, 17 cents is pretty minor uh, in the grand scheme of things in terms of cow cost. And an open cow, you know, if that 550 pound steer is worth $1.50 a pound, uh, those are significant losses. You know, here's an example here, just a feed tag. Uh, it's one of the multi-species listed. And there's some of those direct fed microbials and en enzymes listed uh, that Steve covered. And if you want to convert percentages to parts per million, just move that decimal four places to the right. So we're 0.25%, that's going to equal 2,500 parts per million. You know, here's an example I've got circled. It says feed to beef cattle rate of four ounces per day. You know, somewhere between two to four is probably going to catch the most of our uh, free choice minerals. Usually the higher the rate, you know, look at the ingredients. There's usually dry distillers, some sort of binder uh, in that mineral complex or in that mineral bag. The rate of that binder, uh, like I said, in this case, distiller's grains is going to drive some of that feed intake. So be aware that there's variation. Uh, you know, that free choice mineral somewhere two to four ounces a day. If we're feeding dry hay, our mineral intake might drop. As, you know, and compare that to feeding corn silage where mineral intake, uh, you know, can drop even further up to an ounce per head per day. With hard water, and I, I think, think even more important in a feedlot situation, we need to know what our mineral content or dissolved solids within our water is. But if we have hard water, um, that's also going to influence mineral intake at the rate of about 0.3 to 0.4 ounces per head per day. So kind of in conclusion, uh, mineral deficiencies are hard to de detect. Uh, but when we do have them, we do, do know that they often result in decreased performance. 
Mineral requirements are going to change with our animal stage of production and environmental situations. You know, whether we're feeding dry hay, whether we're feeding corn silage, we have hard water, those type of things that have the potential to reduce feed intake. We know that mineral antagonisms exist. You know, the discussion with copper and sulfur uh, and any imbalances to one extreme or the other may also result in deficiency. You, you know, if we have a mineral at a high level, um, you know, sulfur that's binding copper or the vice versa. Supplementation with organic versus inor inorganic may depend on the severity of deficiency. Certainly, if we have a mineral deficiency within the herd, we want to look at some of those more bioavailable products, those organic minerals, those chelated minerals, uh, and, and stay away from things that, you know, magnesium may, maybe it's the exception in the oxide form. Uh, you know, then if we get to a point where the mineral, mineral deficiency is clinical and chronic, uh, there may be concern in terms of overall animal well being and health. So, look, be sure to look at your feed labels, uh, work with a nutritionist to balance rations uh, and, and make mineral and vitamin decisions. And, and you know, Steve put this slide in here. It's amazing what you can find on a feed label. Uh, as somebody who eats a variety of M&Ms, uh, particularly these ones with peanuts, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing to see that they are produced with genetic engineering. So there's a lot of details in the feed label, you know, including intake, including feeding instructions that we may or may not pay attention to uh, because they're sorted toward the bottom of that tag. Uh, but if we're just looking at that guaranteed analysis and the ingredients, there is potential to miss uh, certainly some instructions that, that can have an impact on the performance of a herd. So with that, if there's any questions, David, I think we can open it up. Absolutely, we, got, we have a small enough group. So if you feel comfortable and wanna unmute yourself and ask a question, um, We'd love you to do that. Or if you want to drop it in the chat, you can do that as well. Not as we're, as people are thinking about questions that they want to ask. I have a question for Steve. You talked about copper, about the minimum a thousand uh, parts per million. But I'm, I noticed when I look on tags, we got anywhere from 1500. I think the one you showed might've been, there's one that was close to 3,200 parts per million. Any thought on that, on where, 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 where should we be as producers? Should I be looking something that's in that 2,500 that I see on some, or can I get away with that 1,500 and not lose sleep over that one? I suspect some of this may depend on milk production. And uh, to be honest, my minimum thousand is, it used to be that I saw mineral bags with 800 and that just wasn't cutting it. So, you know, we ratcheted it up. So I, I personally don't have a problem with somebody that says, well, I need, you know, 2,500. Uh, uh, the 3,100 seems high, but I have no scientific validity to say that that's wrong. Come back to what if there's a real antagonistic situation there? The 3,100 could be working. It's just, uh, I just want everybody to keep in mind that my minimum, I'm pretty stout on that one. But uh, yeah, it depends on your cow. Because we can see some really cheap mineral in some of our stores that you know you're looking at below what ten dollars a bag and you're wondering well what's it missing when it's that cheap yeah. and, and we you change the genetics of cows that 800 parts per million or even less than that was fine for my grandfather's Hereford cows and I don't nothing wrong with Herefords but his Hereford cows were about 700 pounds and uh, probably six pounds of milk if that whereas now you know we consider maybe eight or 10 to be kind of a minimum number in milk production. Oh, great. And Mary asked a great question because, you know, that's a question that we had initially like a month ago, your opinions, and you probably can see that both Steve and Garth in the chat, opinions on, but I'll read it for everyone who may be on a cell phone. Opinions on minerals with IGRs, are they worth it? Does the quality of the mineral change with this option? What are your thoughts on the IGRs? 
if I've got a problem, uh, I think they're worth it. it. It's kind of the same. I'm going to give a similar theme, theme on some of this stuff. Uh, I mentioned where I would use a chelated mineral. I'm going to fix this problem. I'm going to fix it now uh, with hoof problems or uh, say marbling. I and I don't have enough zinc. I'm going to use a chelate. But I shouldn't, I don't think I should have to use something like that with a dry cow in the fall. That's expensive to do. Uh, so, you know, if we've got some issues, I think that they're effective. It's, do, do I need to use it all the time? Yeah, you, you know, and, and to that, to the IGR specifically, you know, if you've got a pink eye problem, you know, I assume it, we're talking about insect growth regulators and mineral. Uh, at least that's what I. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. You know, if you've got a pink eye problem, uh, you know, the time to feed it is to control that first generation of those flies, you know, in late spring, early summer. Uh, if you control the first generation, usually the second and third aren't as bad. Uh, so if you got a pink eye problem, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's prevention versus treatment, right? Um, but you, you know, feed it for 60 days, control that first generation of flies, uh, and, and then look at different options. You know, we had an in-service several years ago. You know, there is some resistance to some of these products, you know, and look at rotating uh, modes of action that control flies on the farm, you know, whether that's the insect growth regulators in the mineral, whether that's fly tags, uh, you know, consider things such as those oilers, dusters. Um, there's a variety of options out there that can be used throughout the year. And year, year differences happen. And, uh, on, and Garth brought up uh, uh, the ear tags and resistance. One of the biggest things we need to do if we're going to use ear tags and they are effective is cut them out in the fall. <laughs> You mentioned about the hay that's been in storage, Steve, about, you know, we might have that couple year old hay and you talked about the vitamin loss. And I think though, so what are your thoughts on if you're using that on a consistent, you know, if you're trying to use up some of that old hay, so you'd be upping the, vit the vitamins and what about vitamin A as you're going into calving into that last part of the, the last trimester, should you be increasing the vitamins to those cat, those brood cows or? What's your thoughts on that? I think we can feed it. Uh, if the cows are looking in good condition, uh, I, their, their requirements, beef cow requirements change. The last mm, 70 days, dark, about right, uh, 70 days of pregnancy, uh, that's when the fetus really grows. And so we need to make sure our cows are in good condition prior to that. But then at that point, that old rough hay, we should have been feeding that sooner. I don't want to use that the last trimester. I want to be on better hay at that point. So yeah, we can use up that junk, but that's, uh, she could be pregnant, uh, but she's in mid-pregnancy. The question that came up a month ago was what should I be, how do I know that that, that mineral tag has what it needs? And you shared with me a document about if you're on forage-based diet, yeah, I think you called it like a ballpark mineral. Is that something that you would um, advocate me sharing to the group um, when you're starting to go down each, like calcium, phosphorus, salt, those levels, what range yeah. you should be in? Or what's your, or is there well, a fact fine. sheet that Ohio State has yeah. that would help us understand each of those things on that tag? Could be, but uh, go to your local feed store. Uh, and, and just look at those different tags. I know, years ago, you're over in that country that uh, we had an Eastern Ohio mineral in uh, Carroll County. And really my ballparks are what we worked up. I, I'm willing to share it, it's not magic, but okay. a lot of the, there's fine feed companies out there and you just look at some of those tags, but yeah, we can share some. And from your two experience, uh, what is one or two things that you've seen, not on Coshocton County farms, these are of course other farms um, in, the, in the state that we might need to improve on when it comes to mineral and vitamin supplementation to our cows? Yeah, I, I think 
the big thing, and I saw this in a presentation this winter, you know, it's vitamin M. It's managing, making <laughs> sure that, you know, making sure that we're providing that mineral, you know, that the mineral feeder is not empty. All right. Because the requirements never go to zero. Uh, you know, so if you don't have that product on hand and, and in the local feed mills got to order it, you know, you can be on a 10 day, two week empty, empty mineral feeder, or you transition to something to a different product. Uh, so just making sure that, uh, you know, and we had a, Wayne and I, we, at the research station, we try to solve the world's problems some days. You know, I think we can agree that providing, uh, you know, a, a high quality mineral doesn't always mean providing the highest cost, right? Uh, but providing one that meets meets the needs. Uh, then I'm a big proponent. You know, Steve talked about his minimum copper levels. I, when I look at a mineral tag, I look for you know what's in that oxide form. Uh, Magnesium, I think, is acceptable. Then I look for the other minerals and a sulfate or, a, you know, one of those other, other forms. Guys, if they want to get a hold of you at a later time, what's the best way to do that? Well, my email boils four at osu.edu. And if the world ever changes, I'll be glad to come see anybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rough or UFF about 72. I'm a little closer than Steve, and at, at this point, would be glad to get out of the office sometime. <laughs> uh, so yep, certainly keep us in mind, and you know, we can work something up with Dave. And yeah, and I was even got, um, uh, we mentioned earlier about some of the pasture and hay research that um, is going to be rolling out. So if you are a producer that wants to look at some research on farm with pasture and hay, let us know. Um, if you want um, Garth or Steve to come out and as we, as we maybe go back to more normal, I'm sure we'll be having more programs. So Steve and Garth, I appreciate you taking time to be with us tonight. Um, appreciate the guys here in the community that asked um, for this topic and that's how we develop our extension programs is by producers asking questions and then those questions translate into programs like this so i appreciate um the group here that was bringing some questions forth um forth um and again if we anything else that we can do for you don't hesitate to give us a call so uh, steve and gar thanks and thanks for everyone for coming on